Welcome to Peoples and Things, where we explore human life with technology. I'm Lee Vinsel. Here's something I bet we can agree about. Since the 1980s, a lot of people in both their work and home lives have adopted personal computers and smartphones. You're still with me, right? I read that something like 90% of American households own at least one computer and 97% of Americans own a cell phone of some type. So how has this adoption of digital technologies affected the economy and work? Like, has it made organizations massively more efficient? Uh, well, uh, that is not so clear. After all, for most of the period from 1980 to the present, measures of productivity growth have been quite low. It seems to be not the case that digital technologies are greatly accelerating output for all of the stoner talk about the singularity or whatever. So does that mean the adoption of digital technologies hasn't been changing work? No, come on, that would be absurd. But precisely how it has been changing work is hard to describe and so far has mostly evaded us, at least when it comes to a synthetic vision of the adoption of these technologies and how it has been playing out in society. This is something I think about a lot. Moreover, when we turn to the social scientific literature on digital technologies and work, we see two trends. First, there's a focus on the role of these devices in fairly high-end white-collar jobs. And second, there's a well-developed literature on the so-called gig economy. You can think of apps like Uber and Lyft and Grubhub and Shopify. The list goes on. And those studies are very interesting, though it seems to me that predictions that these kinds of gig economy jobs would quickly expand and take over ever greater parts of the economy have mostly not panned out. But what about what we might call the ordinary working class? People who work at places like Walmart or other retail stores or Starbucks or warehouses or hair salons or you name it. How have digital technologies fit into working class jobs and how have they affected workers? What do we know about that? Huh? In walks Julia T. Kona's book, Left to Our Own Devices, Coping with Insecure Work in a Digital Age. T. Kona is an assistant professor in the Annenberg School for Communication at University of Pennsylvania. And her book examines the ways that digital technologies play an increasingly important role in the lives of precarious workers, far beyond the gig economy apps like Uber and Lyft. There are so many things I like about T. Kona's book, but here I'll just name three. First, I think this topic is really important. Scholars have paid too little attention to the role technologies have played in the humdrum lives of ordinary working people. It's because they don't care to look. Julia does. Second, I really love the recruitment methods that Ticone used to find interviewees. One of the big things she did is went to places where people buy phones, made connections with them, and followed them into their lives particularly observing how these devices fit into their work lives. It's a brilliant move. We need more of this, please. Third, this is one of the best written books in science and technology studies I have read in a long time. I read a lot of books, including for this podcast, and many of them as pieces of writing are not great. Like a lot of them suffer from this terrible, terrible disease called dissertation-itis. Right from the get-go, right in their introductions, they are full of text walls of empty abstract nouns and mindless, multisyllabic neologisms. I suffer. I suffer for you, my dear listeners. But Julia's book isn't like that. It's really a very nice read. I had this frightening thought while going through it. It was almost like Professor Ticona wrote her book to communicate to ordinary human beings. Can you imagine? It's pretty wild. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Julia Ticona. I had a wonderful time talking with her. You'll see. Hey, 
Get excited! Julia, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for having me. I have been a big fan, longtime listener, first time caller. <laughs> Well, it's great to have you here. So Left to Our Own Devices is a neat book, and it is also beautifully written. Uh, in fact, it's one of the best written books I've encountered in STS for a long time. <laughs> so when you explain to people what it's about, what do you say, and what were you trying to do with it? Uh, thank you, first. <laughs> that's, that's a huge compliment, especially from somebody who... Um, you know, is is such a such a hosting such a platform for scholars in this in this area. So thank you. That's amazing. Um I I think this book is essentially about uh it's responding to the future of work, but it's not about the future uh -huh. of work. <laughs> yes. Um basically I was uh, as a as a you know as a doctoral student and just like observer of the, the social world, I was getting pretty yeah. annoyed um, with the way that the future of work conversation was happening, mostly, um, mm. but not exclusively in like the popular press and kind of policy and think tank world. Um, yes. And just because it felt so disconnected from the reality that I knew, um, and felt like I wanted to respond to that. Um, so that's really that's really where this this project got started um, was noticing mm -hmm. that huge gap. Um, the the more honest answer <laughs> to that question um, is that I had started this research as a response to a gap in the scholarly literature about low wage workers um, mm -hmm. and their use of digital technologies because there just wasn't a ton, at least on the United States context. Um, I borrow um, and am heavily indebted to global scholars who who have been noticing this connection for much longer than we have um, over here in the States. But um, but uh, it was, you know, it started in response to that, uh, but ultimately got a big kick in the pants when Uber happened. <laughs> and uh -huh. all of a sudden there was this huge conversation about low-wage workers and smartphones um, and low-wage work more generally uh, and digital technologies in a way that, you know, I was in the middle of this research and mm -hmm. uh, I had a brand new frame <laughs> for how to how to talk about the research that I had been doing for a while. Um, and these new kind of symbolic associations between low wage workers and mobile phones and entrepreneurship. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I quickly had to figure out a way to um, respond to that, um, which mm -hmm. was very, very useful. <laughs> Mm hmm. And, you know, I think it's in the preface or, you know, the first the first little chunk of text in the book, you talk about where you grew up and how there was like, you know, like people Internet access wasn't easy and people were using their phones more heavily. Where'd you grow up? Yeah, I grew up in upstate New York, um, and I do okay. not mean right outside New York City when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say I'm from southern Canada, um, for uh -huh. anybody who's met me before, um, because that's a more apt <laughs> definition, a more yes. apt description of where I'm actually from. Um, yeah, I'm from a pretty rural, like, small city in upstate New York, um, and I don't completely reveal it because it is pretty close to one of the places that I recruited in yeah, okay. which is a small place. Um, and I don't want to yeah. you know, compromise anybody, but, um, yeah. And so it's not a place where the internet is, uh, taken for granted thing. Um, or I should say mm -hmm. broadband internet. Um, yeah. the mobile internet is a very taken for granted thing there. Um, and mm -hmm. people get their hands on it in a lot of different ways. Um, it is embedded in all kinds of different ways and the ways that people find work and patch together these like, you know, kind of uh, patchworks of work that, that I was noticing among among my friends um, who were coping with uh, the kind of 2007, 2008 recession, um, which is really uh, what inspired a lot of this research. Um, and uh, yeah, just noticing that all of my friends and family who were coping with these jobs were using their mobile phones in ways that as a doctoral student, um, you know, getting my PhD in sociology at the University of Virginia, very, very far and what felt like very, very far away from that context. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't find research that was about them. Um, it was yeah. either about 
uh, you know, low wage workers in India and in China and Vietnam in Africa, mm-hmm. um, or it was about white collar workers. Um, right. and it felt like that was a big problem um, for being uh-huh. able to, to, to say what I wanted to say or see what I want to see, um, in, in, you know, in my own experiences, honestly. Yeah, you had this really nice uh, kind of breakdown of the literature in your introduction where you say, like, you know, when when people study digital technologies, a lot of times it's been focused on white collar workers. Then when it's when it's focused on low wage workers, so often it's been like the gig economy story, like Uber Mm -hmm. and, you know, all these kinds of things. And which was still such a small part of the economy, like there were there were predictions that it was going to like take over so fast, but it's not growing nearly as fast as those predictions had it. And then, you know, like when we do focus on poor folks, so often it's it's couched in terms of like the digital divide and like the exclusion of workers. So it seems like a, 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 it, like if I understand you correctly, you're saying like a variety of factors have come together to leave out like the low wage workers who are using digital technologies all the time to manage their mm-hmm. lives. Yeah. Do I have you right? Yeah, essentially it was, um, you know, me looking around at my social environment and saying, hey, you know, I'm seeing low wage workers across a ton of different industries rely yeah. on these things. Um, and for some reason, um, when I look at, you know, the, the, the popular press, when I look at the discourse, you know, the capital T, capital D, especially about the future of work, it seems like the only workers um, that look anything like um, the folks who I grew up with are working through platforms. Um, mm-hmm. And that just was such a tiny tip of the iceberg, right, of this phenomenon yeah. that I was wanting to talk about and really wanting to, to explain to a much wider audience. So, Um, yeah, yeah. And, and also just to go from, you know, the way that the, and you know, the STS literature is a part of this, but it certainly even goes further beyond that to, you know, uh, the broader literature that I would kind of bring all together to call about digital inequality, like more generally from technology, media, communication, right. Um, is that, you know, when it comes to looking at marginalized, um, workers and technology, we often are coming from this, uh, really strong position of critique, which is, again, extremely necessary, uh, which is, you know, that uh, folks are excluded, folks are marginalized, folks are exploited, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And those are all true things um, and really important things to say. And I hopefully uh, was able to, like, you know, um, advance the ball on those on those items uh, a little bit in this book as well. Um, But the other thing that it that I noticed in the literature on white collar workers that wasn't being translated into the uh, the literature on inequality, digital inequalities when it comes to lower income workers was this sense of, um, meaning and identity and, yeah. you know, any kind of, uh, positive Agency. associations with, yeah. with this kind of risky work, um, that these mm-hmm. workers were doing, right. It's, it's often narrated as, um, being forced into, right. These forms of precarious yeah. work. And certainly that is a huge part of the story, right. Um, right. We don't make these choices freely, of course. Yeah. Um, but uh, it it also felt like you know that wasn't the complete story that workers were telling me about um, on the other side, right? They were yeah. um, proud of what they were doing and how they were mm-hmm. using these things to to cope with really difficult circumstances. And um, in order to really do their stories justice, I had to be able to kind of talk about both of those things. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think we're we're just we've been missing those kind of stories of coping and the agency part of the story. Like, you know, no one chooses this freely, but then how do people like make do? I think your 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 book's full of wonderful stories of people doing exactly that. Can you tell listeners a bit about the research? Um, how you did the research, and especially can you talk about how you recruited folks? Because I thought that was the coolest. A uh, little uh, methodological thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it took a long time. It's definitely the, mo- the not the most time efficient way of doing research on digital technologies mm-hmm. for sure, um, but still highly highly recommended. Um, so I interviewed a um, hundred workers that I bucketed into low and high wage um, categories. All of these folks were doing independent and contingent forms of work, forms of work that we often in the academy call precarious. We kind of lump them all together under this one um, 
kind of label, right? But what that means on the ground is extremely different um, for different sets mm -hmm. of workers. Um, but mostly what it means is that um, these workers don't expect their contracts to continue. Um, they may be working on an occasional basis or a contract basis. Um, they might be uh, might be kind of scheduling insecure in a bunch of different ways. They might be cobbling together income from a few different types of sources. Um, what that means for white collar workers means that they might be kind of underpaid in a full time job and then also like cobbling together a couple of different side hustles on the side um, for uh, the um, service workers or the low wage workers that I talked to. What that usually meant was, um, you know, folks who were working in retail or other kinds of service work who were intentionally being kept at part time schedules by, you know, these large retailers like Walmart and Target and things like that or large grocery chains. Um, who needed to make up that time with a bunch of different types of um, mm -hmm. informal work on the side as well um, as uh, nannies or, you know, um, movers or in construction work or something like that. Um, and so what I did in order to find these people was essentially having to kind of invent a new uh, recruitment method because um, as a sociologist, what sociologists of work usually do is they usually go to people's workplaces, right, in order to find them. Yeah. So as a sociologist of work, you like want to study qualitatively, you know, what people do all day when they say they're, you know, working. Um, you yeah. show up at their office, right, or you show up at the factory or you show up at their, right, like retail location, wherever it is. Um, and you hang out in the break room, you work alongside them, you, you know, try and interview them in different ways. Um, the problem with this group of workers that I wanted to interview is that they didn't have a single place where they were. Um, they have mm -hmm. a bunch of different places where they are. And especially with the white collar workers, sometimes they don't even have a place <laughs> where they are or that place is their yeah. home, right? So they're not the easiest workers to find um, in the first place. So what I decided to do, um, since I was interested in the ways that they were, um, these work conditions were shaping their technology use, was to just go to where they were buying their technology. Um, and, uh, you know, in doing some kind of initial interviews with folks, um, what I found was that, you know, people are responsible for their own technology purchases, right? So um, because these folks are independent and contingent workers, they don't have... Uh, you know, they're not kind of handed a laptop on their first day um, or handed a phone, yeah. right? Like when you when you start to work at uh, Trader Joe's, when you start to work at Walmart, they say, hey, there's a scheduling app and where's your phone so I can help you download it, right? It's not right. Um, giving you a company supplied kind of device, right? So I figured consumer electronic stores would be a really good place for me to meet these folks because that's where people go to like hold stuff and play with it, get their screens fixed when they break um, to argue with a cell phone salesperson for a couple more weeks to pay their bill um, to, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it might be. Um, so I just went there. <laughs> I, I um, as, as many of my uh, students here at, at UPenn will tell you, I was aggressively friendly, which is a, a tactic <laughs> that I would recommend uh, in qualitative field work. Um, I showed up with my clipboard and my earnest PhD student smile, and I tried to get people to agree to talk to me. Um, so were you just hanging out outside? Is that what you were? Well, uh, or did yeah, you, sometimes like, talk outside. Your way okay. Yeah, okay. preferably inside. Um, so okay. I would I would try and approach, you know, I would I would talk to the salespeople. I would ask to talk to the manager and ask if I could just yeah. kind of hang out for a little bit, you know, a couple hours. Usually I would try and pick like different hours throughout the day to get workers who had different kinds of schedules, sometimes in the morning, sometimes mm -hmm. in the evening. Um, I would end up talking to the salespeople a lot who would often just kind of be like, yeah, just hang out and don't tell anybody. I said it was okay. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I was not, there was only one store, I should say, that I was not allowed to be in. And uh, mm -hmm. it is was a very fancy Apple store um, in Georgetown okay. <laughs> in D.C., for those of you who know that. Yeah, yeah. And I should say the employees wanted me to stay and the manager said, no, <laughs> you're not allowed yeah, to be yeah. here. <laughs> um, and they did very helpfully give me an email at Apple Corporate that I could email to, to talk about research that nobody ever got back to me at. But, um, you know, <laughs> happen. Um, so that one I had to stand outside. Um, I also did end up recruiting online a bit because I realized through the first round of interviewees who I recruited um, that especially the high wage workers were doing a lot of their purchasing online um, mm -hmm. through different kinds of online stores. Uh, and so 
I wanted to recruit where they were. Um, and it's uh-huh. impossible to stand outside of an online store. So I ended up um, recruiting in some, you know, Facebook groups and um, through Craigslist and things like that, just to make sure that the samples were kind of being recruited in the same way. And yeah. uh, I didn't notice any huge differences, honestly, in the folks that I recruited in person and, and online. So I felt like that was uh, that was an OK choice to make. Um, but what I noticed through this um, process was actually ended up being a finding of the book, too, which is that, um, you know, consumer retail in the United States, it's not a, you know, uh, not a newsflash to, to many of us, is extremely classed, right? And especially yeah. consumer electronics retail, right? So where yeah, yeah. people buy these really expensive things, um, mm-hmm. for some of us, uh, is extremely shaped by social class, right? So whether you buy your... Um, your phone out of a plastic blister package um, on an end cap at a grocery store or whether you buy it, um, you know, and you get to like hold it in your hands and you can feel the glass and the weight right at this like shiny white Apple store um, Mm -hmm. depends on how much money you have to spend. And essentially what your credit is, um, is what I found also. Um, And those two experiences are really different. And so as an ethnographer, it was cool for me to be able to incorporate those different kinds of um, consumer experiences into the book um, as I as I was writing. And um, in the chapter on low wage workers, I kind of talk about some of the more predatory like financing schemes that I found um, for the low wage worker and the low wage worker sites um, that ended up being a really important finding. So uh, I'm that. It's always great when the recruitment strategy kind of allows you to have new insights into your into your. Yeah, research. no, I thought it was really cool. I, I loved it. And it was just like, yeah, go where to where the phones are. If you want to <laughs> track out like, you know, yeah. Sounds, so sounds things, stupid, but worked. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, well, it makes sense to me. Um, one of the things I liked about your book is um, and this is something I've been chewing on a lot recently. I, I um, very closely follow debates about digital technology and productivity and like why we haven't gotten as much economic growth Mm -hmm. and productivity improvements Mm -hmm. through digital technologies as expected. And of course, there's people on both sides are like, oh, productivity mismeasures things, blah, blah, blah. There's this whole debate about it. But, you know, I'm mostly on the side of people who think, yeah, it hasn't increased productivity as much as we thought it might. And yet it, we don't want to say that where that can lead you is saying digital technology has done nothing in the workplace, which would be foolish and silly to say, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the things I liked about your book is I think it, it, it almost gives like this phenomenological or like first person picture of how people, how it actually is affecting workers' lives, right? So, I mean, like, could you narrate that a bit? Uh, like, if you think about, I don't know, I don't know when you were graduated high school. I, I take it as like the early two thousands. Is that is that right? Okay, I, you're a little you're a little younger than I am, but not a lot. And so I was thinking, like, you know, if we can think about like a worker in you know like two thousand two or two thousand three mm-hmm. versus like a worker working that same kind of job today. Mm-hmm. How do you think digital technology adoption has? change their experience of things like scheduling and and those kinds of things? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that, you know, just to take a step back, I would say that that we would have to say like, what kind of work, right? Like, I think that that it deeply depends on who you're talking about. Um, But, you know, one of the kind of um, maxims of, I, I think, that I've learned as like a technology of work scholar is that, you know, Technologies of work displace labor, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when we think about this, you know, long narrative about labor saving technologies, right? It's like, you know, um, bread and butter, STS, bread and butter, you know, history of tech kind of research um, is, you know, thinking about uh, the ways that these technologies essentially uh, do save some types of labor, um, but they displace others, right? So I think when I see those productivity debates, I think about like whose labor <laughs> has been made more yeah. productive and whose has not, um, or who is doing more of the tasks that used to be um, somebody else's to deal with, right? Like somebody's mm-hmm. manager or somebody's um, boss to deal with, and now it is theirs. Um, so, you know, to their, to, to your point, the, the, the question of scheduling, I think is a really like concrete place where we can see this, um, Mm -hmm. that the labor of scheduling has been just kind of blown into a million smithereens. Um, and while I think this was, um, 
the the ways that white collar workers, you know, dealt with scheduling, right, which is generally much more consistent. They have much more autonomy over their hours. This is was true. It is true. Um, yeah. Is uh, is kind of trickling into um, lower wage work, right? Um, mm -hmm. And by that, I mean not that lower wage workers are given more are being given more autonomy over the hours that they work. You know, absolutely not. Um, but more that the labor of scheduling is being transitioned onto those workers, yeah. right? So, um, you know, whereas before unpaid too, right? Yes, now they're yeah, doing exactly. it in unpaid time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And this is a part of what I talk about um, as, you know, what I call the digital hustle, right? Like this uh, big bevy of activities, this huge set of um, tasks that um, are actually largely shared between high wage and low wage workers in some pretty surprising ways, right? Like the ways that they mm -hmm. use their technologies are actually pretty similar um, and conditioned much more by the insecurity of their work um, than by the, the uh, content of it or by their, their social class even. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, so the, you know, whereas before, uh, you know, switching shifts, uh, in a job or, you know, needing to change your schedule was something that was kind of booted up the chain of command to a manager, um, or to, you know, a, even a shift manager or a floor manager or something like that, or a boss. Um, now that labor is kind of devolved onto workers, right? Cause the assumption is, is that everybody can talk to everybody else. Um, and whether that happens through a designated app or whether that happens, um, uh, you know, the workers themselves can organize, you know, WhatsApp groups, chat groups, or Facebook groups. Um, that is understood to be uh, a labor of, of workers now, right? Like in a way that I mm -hmm. think it wasn't before. Um, mm -hmm. And there are a myriad of other examples of that same thing. But yeah, I think the key in those uh, thinking about those productivity debates is, uh, you know, thinking about like who's who's productivity, <laughs> right? And yeah. and what even counts, right? Like you said, that there are these debates about like what counts as productivity. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's coming from like wonderful feminist work of like what counts as, as labor in the first place, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that... I, I take from or I'm kind of inspired by those approaches for this um, for this research as well as to kind of like, let's expand <laughs> what we understand mm -hmm. as, as a part of, quote unquote, digital labor um, in order to see all of the different creative, uh, incredible ways that workers are being incredibly productive and essentially um, knitting together fragments of a labor market um, in order yeah. to, to make their livelihoods work with these devices. As we, as we t discussed briefly earlier, a lot of research on digital technology got s structured by the whole digital divide thing that came out of the 1990s. But as you write, you know, as this book argues, it's not only exclusion from digital technologies that structures inequalities in opportunities, but inclusion as well. Mm -hmm. So how does how does that work? How does inclusion work to structure the inequality as much as exclusion mm -hmm. does. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I pull a lot from, um, you know, I know you had Dan Green um, on, yeah. on a, a bit ago, um, that his his book, The Promise of Access, has been incredibly helpful for me in thinking about this, um, how this kind of policy discourse got shaped in the first place and what it looks like now in terms of our institutions. Um, the way that I kind of enter into that conversation is like, look, you know, these technologies were first studied by scholars in the context of white collar work um, because that's where they were first used. You know, there's there are reasons yeah. for this. It wasn't just, you know, pure blind um, blindness or malice or something like that on the part yeah. of researchers. Um, you know, if we wanted to understand how these things were going to be affecting work, we studied the workers who were using them at first, which were white collar yeah. office workers, right? It made absolute sense um, at the time. It no longer does <laughs> in order mm -hmm. to uh, study the way that these technologies are, are affecting people or um, the ways that workers are using them from a more like worker side perspective. Um, but what I really, you know, I'm a, I'm a comparativist at heart, I think, um, you know, in mm -hmm. order, I think in order to understand any social phenomenon in my brain, it just makes sense to kind of throw it against something else, right? That it's kind of, it's, it's very difficult to, um, it's one way of gaining context, right? On any kind of social phenomenon is to be like, okay, uh -huh. well, how does it look different for somebody else? It's like bread and butter kind of um, understanding social inequalities, right? To look at something by class. Um, so, you know, it made sense to me to, uh, you know, study these things from both perspectives, both high wage workers and low wage workers at the same time. And interestingly, you know, what I found when I was in interviewing these high wage workers was, um, you know, them 
kind of hemming and hawing during the interview about their interviews being boring for me, um, which I thought was really interesting. So they were saying like, oh, you know, I, I hope this is useful to you. You said you're, you said you were interested in inequality or you said you were interested in, um, you know, marginalized workers or insecure workers. And, you know, I just, I don't know, you know, I don't see myself that way or, uh, you know, and I would ask them questions about like, uh, just in the opening or closing of the, of the interview, just to kind of chat with them about like, Oh, what plan, what's your cell phone plan? Or like, how much data do you have in your home office? Or, you know, like, what's your setup yeah, yeah. there? What are you working with? And, um, I almost thought it was like the way that like, I don't know. I imagine like pilots talk to each other about their work. Like what you flying on today, you know, like just like, yeah, talking yeah. about like, the, to- the tools, of the trade, you know? Um, yeah. and, uh, and to a letter, <laughs> I would say to a one, um, the high wage workers were like, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know how much it costs every month or, yeah. um, I'm not exactly sure. You know, mm, let me check for you. Like, let me get back to you. Um, and, uh, most, if not all, of the low wage workers not only knew exactly how much everything costs, but also always asked me, like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. what do you have? And, you know, had, did you hear of anything else? Or what do you think about T Mobile? Or, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, and so <laughs> right. it was very clear to me um, that privilege was in operation here, right? Like, when you, when mm-hmm. you see people who don't really have to think about something, um, and seem sort of ill-informed about it, um, that yeah. means it's probably working all right for them, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm, um, it's right. not a source of, like, constant mental work <laughs> that they have to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so once I started seeing that, um, I started saying, like, oh, right. So, you know, there's there's definitely mm-hmm. privilege um, operating here as well as marginalization. Um, and it, it really forced me to think about, as a scholar, um, the ways that this digital divide framework really shaped my own, the, the ways that I was approaching this project, right? Um, this didn't mm. happen um, beforehand, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't go into this saying, hey, I want to study privilege, right? Like, I, I that, that happened because of this comparative angle on this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially reinforced by not only just, you know, the way that people talked about their everyday use or their, their like, technologies that they were working with, but also the ways they talked about what they were doing with them, right? Um, once I came mm-hmm. to this conclusion that, you know, people were kind of doing very similar things with their technologies during the day. Um, and I started paying more attention in the interviews to the ways that, that those uses were treated by the people around them um, at their mm-hmm. workplaces. Mm-hmm. And again, I should say, you know, I only have one side of this story, right? So all I have is workers' own understandings of how their use were was, was right. being interpreted by their coworkers or managers. Um, I didn't get to um, to interview the management side of these things or yeah. other coworkers, um, except like by accident. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But uh, so, you know, what the high wage workers were telling me was being received as this like skilled use of their time um, by their bosses. So when they would engage on social media about the projects that they would wor- they were working on, when they would brand themselves using their own social media, when they would publicize the, you know, the companies that they were working with, if they were like contract workers, um, when they would have their several phones out on their desk in order to be attending to them all the time, even if that was attending to their kids' daycare or nanny, right? Um, yeah. It looked like <laughs> they were doing what they should be doing. Um, and for low-wage workers, it was the exact opposite, right? It looked like distraction. It looked like something you should not be doing, even if it was explicitly a part of their jobs, like looking up the price of something for a customer yeah, yeah. on a company website. Um, or cocktail recipes. Yeah, exactly. Cocktail recipes, right? Yeah. So, and they had to hide it. They have, you know, there was lots right. of conversations to me about like how to fold an apron so that you can't, nobody could tell that you were like, you had your phone on you and you could feel the vibration against your, against your body, um, but nobody else could see it. Um, making mm-hmm. sure that the screen that would light up when somebody would call was facing towards you as opposed to outward. So nobody could see that that was happening through your pocket or through your apron. Mm-hmm. Um, stashing something in a locker and hustling up and down the stairs, right? To that, to that employee break room in order to, in order to see those things. Um, and so again, right, this was another site where I was like, okay, right, these conditions are set up in such a way that, um, you know, workers are including themselves. That's a 
period, full stop. Um, yeah. But the way that that use is received by the workplaces is extremely different. And so when we think about, you know, the ways that we count, quote, in quotes, um, what is skilled technology use and who yeah. needs these devices and for whom this is an essential part of work, um, that that requires a big fat question mark in my book, mm-hmm. right? Um, that uh, I think workers would say a very different thing than than their CEOs as to as mm-hmm. to who you know who needs this stuff. I thought what you said about being a comparativist was interesting. So is that part of your sociological training? Did you get that in grad school, or is that from a deeper? Is that just you? I don't know. Where's <laughs> it coming from? Uh, yeah, I would say that's the sociological training. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean. I could say, you know, I think not to like psychologize myself or anything, Mm -hmm. um, but, you know. Well, we do that on that show. uh, Yeah, Yeah, okay, all right, cool, let's do it. Um, Let's get into it. Um, I think, um, you know, I see myself as somebody who's grown up in a bit of, uh, in a bit of a, in two contexts, right, in in kind of a big way. Um, You know, I... I grew up in this uh, pretty blue collar town um, Mm -hmm. that had fell on some pretty hard times right when I was in a pretty formative part of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, And my parents are both, you know, white collar professionals. They're in the in the helping professions and extremely valued education and knew, you know, from a young age that they wanted me to get out. They wanted me to go to college. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to, you know, have the things that they had. Um, My mom's a former nurse. My dad's a former um, public school teacher. And, um, you know, when I went to, I had the great fortune to go to, uh, you know, this kind of elite liberal arts, all women school. Um, You know, when I went there and was exposed to the world of letters, right, the kind of scholarly Mm -hmm. world, um, I, it was a revolution for me, right? Um, And it felt, they, they felt incredibly separate. Um, and I, I yeah. reflect on this moment a lot, actually, that um, when when I was applying to graduate school, um, and I like to tell these stories, too, for anybody, any anybody who's listening, who's had this kind of experience or who is interested in applying to a Ph.D. program. Right. Like um, it's it's a foreign world um, and it is supposed to feel that way. Um, it's not just mm-hmm. you. <laughs> right. Um, it's not. It is it is a world unto itself. Um, and it's sometimes that is on purpose to be a gatekeeper. Right. For to to allow mm-hmm. to disallow new entrants. Um, when I was applying to graduate school, um, to Ph.D. school from undergrad, um, I included a letter of recommendation from my boss at the campus uh, center where I worked on a federal work study. Um, I sold bus mm-hmm. tickets um, and I was at the like welcome booth to my college, right? Like I was that that girl um, who would like give people directions. And that was my federal work study job. Um, and there was a woman who ran that um, building at my college and she was a, an absolute force of nature. She was absolutely wonderful. The, one of the most effective human beings I've ever met in my life. And I knew her really well, and she knew me for four years. And so I included, I asked her for a letter, and I included that letter in my PhD applications. And um, about halfway through my PhD journey, I, you know, kind of was talking to one of my professors about, like, how I was, how I was going and, like, what I, where I had applied and what letters. And they were horrified that I had asked this person. And they, I shouldn't say horrified. Not that yeah. this, I mean, they were just like, oh no, right? Like how how did you not know that this is not what you should do, right? That it, they don't yeah. actually want to know that you're a good worker. Um, right. They don't care that you showed up on time for all your shifts. Um, right. They want letters from your professors about your scholarly potential, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I had yeah. no idea about that, right? Um, to yeah. me, applying to graduate school was about learning how to teach and learning how to become a professor. Yeah. And so I thought that it's would, just a job. Man. Yeah, exactly. I thought I thought that would be a great thing to include. Um, yeah. It wasn't <laughs> apparently. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, don't let that stop you. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I, I think about that moment a lot when I think about my own scholarly trajectory, right. As like somebody who, um, studies these things because I have run up against the boundaries between them, um, a whole bunch of times. Uh, and now here I am like sitting in my office at Penn. So, uh, it's a constant, um, uh, sense of, I, I am in a constant sense of amazement of these things and also always trying to work really hard to like denaturalize <laughs> the, the process that led me here, um, which mm-hmm. was a series of lucky breaks and mentorship and um, uh, 
and privilege, honestly, right? Um, yeah. To, to get through those those hoops um, with with you know uns, unscathed or with minimal scarring. <laughs> Yes, yes. Side. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think I would like to say like, oh, yeah, I've been a member of two cultures. And so, you know, I've, I've crossed those boundaries. And I like to think that I like hop back and forth across them. Uh, and I'm fascinated by the boundary, those that kind of class mm-hmm. boundary, um, and especially between academia and like the rest of the world as well. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I also think it was my sociological training. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, that allowed me to see that um, and how to actually incorporate it into uh, a strength of my research instead of just like a weird thing about me. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. That was great. And I identify with a huge amount of it. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you tell us about what's what's the digital hustle? How do you how do you define that term and how do you think about it? So the digital hustle is what I ended up calling this huge set of similarities in in practices or strategies that I saw between high wage and low wage workers, right? Felt like I had to call it something because it's essentially this bundle of different activities that are all unpaid um, that uh, I saw workers doing um, with their digital technologies in order to make a living, right? In order to get Mm -hmm. the gigs, in order to secure the gigs, in order to keep the clients, in order to find the clients, in order to get paid, right? Um, Or to keep their um, modems running, to keep their devices running, right? Um, So I, you know, there's a long conversation about invisible labor um, within, you know, science and technology studies, but also within sociology um, and a lot of other uh, places in, in the academy about like the work that is work, but we don't notice it as work. Um, And Mm -hmm. so I felt like it was an important um, thing to name this bundle of things (laughs) that we do Mm -hmm. in order to kind of um, draw on that tradition. Again, this is kind of where the feminist feminist, uh, scholarship comes in um, and to to point out that it is unpaid and it's essentially a tax (laughs) that's being levied uh, on on workers. Um, And... uh, Yeah. And so that includes things like, you know, maintaining a personal website. It includes things like posting, you know, employment friendly things on social media or making sure to untag yourself from employer unfriendly things. Um, It includes things like, uh, you know, extremely promptly responding to every single text message that comes in to, mm. from anybody who might potentially be an employment lead or a, co- a client of yours someday. Um, it also includes things like, um, you know, researching the best deals um, on uh, cell phones, on data, and um, fixing things when they go down, right? So um, mm-hmm. in some of my rural, in, in, in my rural field site, I, I should say, um, You know, when there was an ice storm, uh, you know, the Internet would go down or the electricity would go out and the folks who were working remotely uh, or the folks who really needed to get in touch with their bosses uh, had to find somewhere else to be. Right. So it's like Mm -hmm. the labor of, you know, figuring out where else you can get connected when you are disconnected um, as well. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there's a huge number of different kinds of labor that go into the digital hustle. And I wanted to kind of name it in order to see it, um, which is, you know, a uh kind of uh an important thing that we get to do as scholars yeah and um you know one of, i like one of the one of the sections in that well there was a lot of sections i liked in that chapter one of them is about maintenance um of course. which was great and uh it also made me it made me feel shame again about my out of date personal website but also <laughs> like uh <laughs> Also, like, just showed me also that it's like a, a privilege that I can have an out of date mm-hmm. personal website that just sits there and I don't care about it, like shows shows where I kind of fit in the mm-hmm. world. But uh, there was a wonderful section on identity. And uh, I think it was subtitled something like between the hustle and the heart. And I think that, you know, we 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 know we have a literature on identity formation and kind of like entrepreneurship mm-hmm. and innovation and all this kind of like, you know, a Silicon Valley hustle culture, right? And in those worlds, you know, it's not just Silicon Valley actually, but you know, all these high tech cities and stuff. Mm-hmm. But what if, what is the identity formation look for like for low wage workers mm-hmm. who are also kind of forming identity through through these digital technologies. Yeah, um, that's a, a good reminder to talk about the other part of the digital hustle, which is not just this like market orientation or this economic orientation of, you know, having mm-hmm. to having to do these things because you need to keep the lights on kind of thing. 
Um, mm-hmm. But the other really important thing that work gives us outside of, you know, being able to keep, um, you know, body and soul together economically um, is identity, right? Um, and meaning in, in our daily lives. Um, and what I saw um, was, again, kind of looking at this through the literature on Silicon, you know, early kind of Silicon Valley self-branding kind of stuff. I think about um, Alice Marwick's, you know, absolutely amazing book, Status Update. Um, that was a really early look at this. I look at um, Gina Neff's Venture Labor, um, yeah. and a bunch of other um, really wonderful early works on uh, that white collar kind of the romance of risky work um, mm-hmm. literature, right? Uh, that... I was hearing echoes of the same thing among the low-wage workers that I was talking to, but I didn't really have a way to make sense of that, right? Um, Because oftentimes when we talk about those workers, we talk about them as lacking agency. Um, And as as I mentioned before, being forced into these jobs and being exploited by technology and technology companies. And yes, those Mm -hmm. things are absolutely true. Yeah, that's real. Um, But they, it's not the whole story, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, work is changing at, at, at quite a clip um, and, you know, meaning making doesn't stop, right? Like that's what we do as humans um, is we we figure out how to make our lives meaningful in really difficult circumstances. That's what we've done forever. Yes. Um, and so I think this this case is is um, is just another case of, of that longer phenomenon. Um but you know, also a really important place to draw on, draw from a different set of literature um, instead of just thinking through these kinds of critiques of um, Silicon Valley culture and kind of looking at the ways that um, precarious employment relationships shape, you know, uh, the way that people load up precarious work with this like you know entrepreneurial entrepreneurial zeal and you know yeah. um, personal responsibility and risk which of course is a big part of this conversation but also um you know the literature that I ended up um, drawing in was this literature on craft work right um hmm. and a particular meaning of craft right there's a lot of like kind of craft uh, literature on craft that draws on you know women's traditions of like Um, you know, artisan craft work and thinking about, you know, um, gift economies and, you know, things that um, women, you know, traditionally feminized forms of art making, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But what I'm talking about or the literature that I draw in is more thinking about like pre-industrial artisanal work that's often done by men, right? So thinking about Mm -hmm. like carpentry and, um, you know, uh, furniture making and, you know, woodworking and things like mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. Um, where, uh, you know, people's identities are wrapped up in not only what they make, not only the product that they make, um, and feeling a great deal of pride in, you know, a beautifully made chair or a beautifully made cheese or something even, mm-hmm. um, but also the tools that they work with, right? Um, and kind of attending to your tools in a particular kind of way and the, the skill that's required to handle particular kinds of tools are a big part of um, the pride that one feels um, mm-hmm. in one's profession. Um, I saw some of the same things. So again, some of these same echoes um, coming through the ways that people talked about setting up, you know, their phone in a particular way or getting a new phone and engaging in that process of like, okay, I got to make sure all my settings are exactly the way I want it. And I got to get my exact right ringtone. And I have to figure out the right, the like how to do all this stuff. So I, you know, it's exactly how I like it. And I have my calendar synced up in exactly the way I want it to. And it was this sense of like, you know, pride and just, um, there was a, there was a kind of joy and a sense of learning, right. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, trial and error over time when people gave me these, um, crazy stories about, you know, when things went wrong, which is a a great, uh, interview question to ask people when you ask them about their work practices to say, like, tell me a story about when things went fantastically wrong for you with your, (laughs) with your devices. Right. Oh, Um, they got stories, right? Yes, exactly. Right. Like we all have that time of like, oh my gosh, right. Like when I didn't think my camera was on and it was, um, and, you know, those stories often elicited these learning, these moments of learning. And um, that, that sounded to me really similar to, you know, a, a crafts person talk about, mm-hmm. you know, oh, my God, I gashed my hand open on that saw that time. You know, it's like 
it's these um, marks of the of the trade, right? Um, and this kind of pride in in overcoming and and becoming less of a novice over time, um, mm -hmm. with learning how to not only learning how to use these technologies, but also learning how to deal with these really adverse labor market conditions, right? Um, mm -hmm. Worn kind of like a badge of of accomplishment. Um, and and these uh, that that lent meaning to their to their lives. It lent meaning to to what they were doing and the choices that they had made um, about what they wanted to do all day and um, how they earned their money. And so I felt like again that um, it it was worth marking. You know that these strategies are not only economic but they are also affective or they um, mm -hmm. they impact the way that we feel about ourselves and about our work. Yeah. Can we talk a bit more about the costs of inclusion for low wage workers? So I feel like we've talked about it a bit already, but I wanted to pull out more of the kind of difference and mm -hmm. to set it aside, set it apart from the digital privilege part of your argument. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we could talk about provisioning Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, you pick your favorite example, but what what kind of stands out for low wage workers that doesn't apply to so many of us? My favorite example, because um, it is the most kind of egregious and still uh, something that is still happening um, all mm -hmm. over this uh, ecosystem, is financing. Um, and mm -hmm. this is something that I feel like for high higher wage consumers um, that many of us are just blissfully unaware of. Um, and also... Mm -hmm. These are practices that I, that I was picking up in 2000, you know, 2012, 2013, that I've now seen like proliferate across online consumer spaces, right? Mm. Um, so for anybody who actually, you know, this is the, we're recording this in like the holiday season and the run up to, you know, Christmas and all that stuff, yeah. that anything, any um, of these kinds of limited term, uh, they're not credit, but they're like credit, right? Like firm yeah. or, right? Like buy now, pay later kind of schemes. Um, mm -hmm. the, I, I think a lot of these things were being tested in the low wage cell phone market, honestly, um, because I was seeing them, uh, a while ago, um, wow. hang out it, as I was hanging out in these stores. Um, so, you know, I have this story in the book where, uh, you know, I was, I was hanging out in this, um, it was a T-Mobile store. And, uh, you know, it was this, in this like pretty urban, it was an, er, in my urban field site, it was in one of the uh, low income neighborhoods that I was in. It was a really busy kind of rush hour crush. Um, the manager had the doors open, was like blasting music and, you know, was kind of in, in, out on the sidewalk and inside, you know, was this like real aggressive salesman type guy. Um, and there was just kind of a lull in the foot traffic, right? Like it was between trains or something like that. And he started talking to me and he was like, you know, can I sell you a phone? Like, what do you got? You know, what are you, what are you using? <laughs> and I said, oh, no, no, no. Like, I, you know, I'm a PhD student. Like, they don't pay us very much <laughs> to do what we do. I don't have any money. I'm mm -hmm. broke, blah, blah, blah. And um, and he handed me a flyer, right? Like the flyer that he was handing out to to everybody else, um, which was for this program called Smart Pay. Um, which essentially was a cell phone leasing program um, that mm -hmm. would allow people to make, uh, you know, what looked like pretty manageable monthly payments um, on these extremely expensive devices, right? Like hundreds and hundreds of dollars um, mm -hmm. on a new, you know, iPhone or something like that at the time. Um, and uh, when I did some digging into these companies, um, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> and it mm -hmm. looked a lot like, um, you know, a payday loan for a phone, right? Yeah. Um, so it was basically an exploitative financial instrument that would make cell phone ownership look affordable, um, but at the end of the day, be even more expensive, make the phone even more expensive than it would have been for somebody who had been able to pay for it out of pocket up front. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think about things like this, um, when I see cell phone companies offering, you know, these forms of flexibility, um, when I, you know, you even look at the differences between what are called prepaid and postpaid contracts, right? So like either you use... Um, you, you know, pay monthly and you um, 
you kind of get credit from the cell phone company and you say, oh, I promise I'm going to pay for the data that I'm using after you use it. Or if you have to pay for that up front, right? Like a lot of those differences as to what people have access to has 100% has a lot to do with um, one's mm. credit history, right? And so that allows us to kind of open up into this larger conversation, which is going on across disciplines, across fields, and is extremely policy relevant, even taps into things like education, debt, and financing, right? Yeah. That, um, you know, the ways that companies um, are able to exploit uh, the need for an extremely expensive good that has become mm -hmm. la has become mandatory, right? Like a college yeah. education or like a smartphone, um, and have managed to make it appear affordable or to make people believe that it will be affordable, right? On future promise yeah. um, of of you know being able to be paid back by it. Um, in a way that is just a raw deal um, and makes it yeah. way more expensive. Um, and so I think it was Matt Desmond actually in his a book, in his evicted book, that's like, actually it's really expensive to be poor. <laughs> yeah, 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 um, we tax and, the poor. Yeah, yeah it's, it's extremely expensive. And that is extremely true in consumer electronics and in smartphones particularly. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, once it kind of smacked me in the face that these workers were being required by the conditions of their labor markets to have smartphones and like right. relatively sophisticated ones at that. Um, ones that were reliable, sometimes multiple smartphones, right? In case some yeah. broke because they were kind of cheap, the ones that they were able to afford. Um, and they were also being soaked by these financing yes. companies. Um, it made me really mad um, and it made me yeah. uh, realize that there was a part of the kind of political economy of this um, that is just extremely different between high wage and low wage workers. And it's something that is, I think, largely invisible to folks who are able to yeah. uh, to stomach the costs of these the upfront costs of these. Of mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. No, I mean, I, I do a lot of work with uh, uh, and I'm very in, uh, inspired by the folks who run United Way's ALICE program, which is this program that measures economic hardship in the United States. And they find over and over that like 40% of American households can barely afford to make ends meet. But they have this county, they have an algorithm, they go in and look at costs at the county level, and then they see what percentage of the population can afford it. But, you know, at some point, cell phones became part of that measure. It wasn't mm -hmm. initially. But it's just like you have to have it. And I think what you're pointing out is that, you know, you have to have it and yet you don't have the money for it. And the way that you end up getting it is through these exploitative financing programs. Mm -hmm. So there's all these ways we tax poverty, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and essentially it's another um, it's another, uh, you know, way that employers are forcing costs onto workers, right? So totally. there's a number of different ways. Again, this makes, um, you know, digital technologies a part of this wider conversation about like the costs of having a job. Um, yeah. You know, uh, we have folks who are, you know, pointing out that, you know, things like on the job training has just taken an absolute nosedive of, yeah. over the past, you know, uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, and in a way that, you know, just forces the cost down right onto um, prospective workers. And this is, you know, um, digital technology use is just another place where we see these costs, literal economic costs, mm -hmm. um, piling up onto worker shoulders in a way that um, just was not always true. Mm -hmm. So you have a neat chapter on uh, how both high and low wage workers resist the hustle and try to dodge out of the constant connection and compliance with norms at times. So, you know, how do, but it also, the chapter also kind of draws out their differences here um, in your kind of comparative way. So how do low and high wage workers do and experience resistance uh, differently? Uh, so a couple of the different ways, um, you know, that I, that I pulled out, that were, you know, both similar and different um, between mm -hmm. uh, between these two groups um, was that a, you know, again drawing on this um, surprising similarities across class um, theme that is that is throughout this book is that you know technologies were a site for both groups right where they were um, where they were resisting in some ways um, but mm -hmm. what that looked like for both groups was was different um, conditioned by their different kinds of workplaces. Um, so what I found were 
Um, on the low-wage worker side, where workers talking about diving into their phones or finding refuge in their devices um, in order to um, limit uh, their commitments to work mm -hmm. um, or in order to bound them in some useful ways. And so, you know, um, the ways that you see this happening, just kind of like the, the firsthand accounts of it is, um, you know, this like cocktail waitress that I talked to who um, talked about, uh, you know, when she was uh, when she was at work, um, being able to uh, find either spots in the restaurant or moments in her shift where she was able to just kind of like block everybody else out and to, you know, check her messages or listen to the music that she wanted to listen to or scroll through social media as a way of alleviating the pressures of service work mm -hmm. um, for a moment during her shift. Um, and, uh, she especially found a lot of refuge on, on Twitter where she was participating in this hashtag where, um, other, you know, service workers were kind of posting about complaining about their, um, yeah. experiences, right. Which to me as a, as a kind of feminist labor scholar, um, are all about sexual harassment and the, the indignities mm -hmm. that are, um, leveled at female service workers, right? So it was a lot of like, you know, coworker grab my ass. It's a lot of like, look at the shitty tip, um, you know, or people, clients writing their phone numbers on things, you know, to suggest that they should give them a call, like off, off the off hours. Um, and, you know, just provided the space for them to kind of be seen um, by other mm -hmm. folks. Um, but interestingly, I didn't see a whole lot of, um, you know, this wasn't a moment of like a, a hashtag that like, took off and, you know, went, you know, viral and right. Like there's all this beautiful, like interaction among people. Yeah. Um, it most, there wasn't a whole lot of interactivity there. Um, it was a lot oh. of just like people shouting into the void. Um, it seemed like, um, oh, but you know, from the perspective of this person, this was a really important vent for her yeah. right? um, in order yeah, yeah, yeah. to feel like she had some kind of a record of her experiences and that she could read other people's. And even if she wasn't liking them because that may have felt weird. <laughs> um, yeah. but, right. That she, she felt like she was a part of this, um, that she wasn't alone. Right. In, in mm -hmm. these experiences, which is both good and bad. Right. Um, mm -hmm. because it, it's kind of allows this like apologetic, um, to happen. Right. Sometimes these vents allow for, uh, this, the stalling of necessary action within workplaces. And mm -hmm. sometimes they let people keep their, you know, body and soul together, right? And in order yeah, to yeah, like, yeah. get on with the shift, right? So no, it's um, complicated. Both, yeah. both can be true at the same time. And I tried to illustrate that. Um, and then, you know, comparing that with the high wage workers, what I saw was, you know, maybe a somewhat more familiar and predictable to some of the listeners of this podcast, certainly to myself, is this language of like resisting technology, right? Like resisting mm -hmm. the device in order to resist work. So putting putting the laptop, actually shutting the laptop down, right? Like mm -hmm. actually not just closing the top, um, but shutting it down, um, putting the phone in a drawer or engaging in some kind of like digital detox um, in quotes program. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, the digital Sabbath or whatever. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. These things that were uh, galling to me as a as a PhD student. <laughs> these trends that uh, you know I wanted to problematize right like uh, a decade or so ago. Although they rear their head every once in a while, right? It's, oh, they come back. Yeah. They're never gonna leave us alone. It, so? it seems like we. I think it's gonna be another it. ten or twenty years. I don't know. <laughs> it seems like we get past it and then. Yeah. It's called mindfulness, right? Like Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then Ezra Klein has another like podcast where it just says like something we said in 2012, you know? It's just it's amazing. <laughs> Dust off that back. old critique again and <laughs> yeah. rub it back out there. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, I should say too, Mel Gregg has a great has a great book on um, thinking. Has great uh, book on like mindfulness practices and in thinking about technology that is absolutely um, stupendous. As is a lot of her stuff. So um, cool. I should have her on. I like her a lot. Yes. She's 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 great. Yeah. Um, you also had this section on um, which I thought was wonderful, and you know, obviously has big gender for ramifications, but it, you know, it's about the limits of refusal. And you talked about tethered care work. Um, and, you know, I think this is one of the, the, the like fascinating things about these devices in the workplace, as you've already mentioned it earlier, but a lot of times we're tending to children and family members like while we're on the job, but like these, these devices are kind of have been looped into all this work of, you know, social reproduction, care work and all these things. So mm -hmm. 
What were you finding, you know, like, how was that playing out for both low and high wage workers? Yeah, so a kind of exceptional case to the, Mm -hmm. you know, what I call privileged refusal, right? So like the what the high wage workers were doing where they were like, just going to put my phone in a drawer and I'm going to enjoy my vacation or Mm -hmm. I'm just going to focus on this document that I have to write and I'm going to turn my phone off or I'm going to, you know, close out of my email client, for example. Um, that a very notable exception to that rule were moms. <laughs> um, uh-huh, yeah. And I wanted it to be <laughs> Go <parents>. figure. Yeah. <laughs> and there were a couple of dads, um, but it was yeah. mostly moms. Um, yeah. Where they just felt like that was not something they were ever allowed to do. Um, yeah. And again, a lot of times when I ask this question about like sometimes, you know, a time when things went stupendously wrong for you, um, it was oftentimes for these women, it was oftentimes where their devices were just this collision of work and family together in these like explosive ways. Right. Um, And so, uh, you know, one of the folks that I interviewed, um, uh, Saram, who is, uh, you know, quoted in the book, um, she is a I think she was a like an HR trainer or an IT trainer contractor. Um, She had a small business um, and she was uh, scheduled to, or I think she was relieving actually, uh, uh, her business partner and she was going in to do one of these trainings, you know, she would show up in a corporate office park and, you know, set up shop in a conference room for a little while, give her PowerPoint presentation, do a worksheet with a few people and, um, you know, go home. Um, and she loved doing that because it, you know, kind of allowed her this flexibility, um, to get her kid on and off the bus. Um, and this one day (laughs) where, you know, the client was inflexible and she really wasn't going to be able to do that. Um, and she was like, is my kid old enough to get off the bus by himself? Like, I'm not Mm. quite sure, um, that, uh, that, you know, she was in the middle of her, you know, she had, she had prepared the kid for like a week and, you know, they walked through the steps and he even practiced it a couple of times. And, um, the, uh, you know, the, the moment came where she was in the middle of this training and she just saw her phone light up, um, with her kid's number at the time that, right. Um, that they were supposed to be getting into the house. And she just said, you know, I freaked out, right? Like I had to, I had to yeah. put it on break. I had to take, I had to get out of there. I had to take that phone call, right? There was no way, there was no, um, shutting it off. There was no segmenting those worlds apart from one another in that moment. Yeah. Um, and you know, of course the, 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 the one person who she didn't want to see her, you know, taking that personal phone call, the person who was contracting her to do this kind of training, um, you know, walked by, just ha- so happened to walk by and like see all these, you know, employees milling around in the hallway when they weren't supposed to be. And she felt, you know, out of control um, at the moment and really like she wasn't doing um, what she had to do by her job, but also doing what she had to do by her kid. Um, yeah. So, you know, all of these um forms of resistance were kind of um, constrained by things like gender, right? In different ways, yep. um, even for the totally. high-wage workers. Yes. So what's up next? What's the next project? You, we're, before we pressed record, you were saying you're gearing up for book two. So what is it? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> this is, uh, it's like, it's kind of an embarrassing thing to say. <laughs> Maybe mm. this is not the way to, to introduce this project. But, you know, so I talk about in the conclusion to this book is like, we need to think about precarious work beyond labor platforms. And right, like labor platforms mm-hmm. are really conditioning and limiting our imagination as to the digital technologies yeah. that are important. And I have spent the last five years studying a labor platform. So <laughs> that's that's all fun. right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, of course, the way that I'm doing it is, you know, is totally different. <laughs> well, what yeah. is the platform? <laughs> <laughs> well, I should say it's not just one platform, but it is okay. um, an area of um, the kind of digital labor ecosystem that I think is really, really undercovered, which is care work. Um, Uh So I have been studying um, domestic work platforms and in general, um, the ways that the Internet has been shaping uh, the informal uh, labor market of domestic work and especially of care work for children um, Mm -hmm. for the past four or five years. Um, That's awesome. I have written a bit about this um, and I'm really, really excited to kind of get to stretch out in a way that I can't do um, in a white paper or in an academic article. Um, and to talk about um, the ways that I think our understanding of uh, labor platforms needs a healthy dose of women. <laughs> um, because yeah, yeah. If, we, if we look at the kind of history of degraded forms of labor in the United States, 
Um, Mm -hmm. We have a lot to learn from the conditions that women have faced, especially care workers, especially domestic workers over time, um, in thinking that anything is new (laughs) about this Mm -hmm. future of work. Um, And I think that uh, adding those histories, adding that really important context to our understanding of um, the quote unquote platform economy is yeah. uh, a really important addition to the ways that we understand what's going on um, and the effects of these uh, of, of the internet um, across yeah. you know this kind of like informal economic space. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I mean, I love it. I, I think care work's a important and largely understudied area, and uh, it's coming up in my work a lot too. When I'm writing about the new economy uh, moment in the 1990s. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm writing a paper about Robert Reich as Secretary of Labor, but also his kind of intellectual work on the new economy in the mm-hmm, '90s. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's he, he was he's one of these people who was projecting that digital technology was going to give rise to all these high skill mm-hmm. uh, knowledge work, um, and was saying so in his writings. And yet, his own Bureau of Labor Statistics was projecting that the fastest growing category of worker was home health care workers and, they were and right. that's exactly what fucking exactly. happened right, they were right on. <laughs> yeah no i mean they were right mm-hmm. and so you know it's 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 exactly this kind of space uh you know growing so much in the last 30 mm-hmm. years and you're right i mean it's all managed through platforms at this point just like everything else mm-hmm. i mean that's how we manage work now so that's great mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and where are you at are you in the write-up phase then is that i mean yeah 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 i have cool. so i started this work um as a postdoc at the data and society okay. research institute you know we put out this white paper um along with alex rosenblatt and alexander matisco who have been my like um interlocutors mm-hmm. for years Um, and I really, after that, you know, we had this like real, like splashy release of this thing and we got all this like media attention and it was this narrative of like, there are women in the gig economy. Like, what do you mean? Um, it's not all like Uber drivers and, you know, um, uh, it was galling. (laughs) Um, I I should say surprising. It was extremely surprising. Um, and of course, it's a great media hook, right? And it was it was a wonderful opportunity for me to you know increase mm-hmm. my like awareness of this really important issue, and um, the fact that there are these workers who are right like laboring through these platforms or whose work is significantly impacted by the rise of these platforms. Um, but over time, it got really old, <laughs> right? Um, uh-huh. And it just made me wonder like why are we surprised? Um, why are we surprised when women have been the ones who have who have been, you know, at the forefront of these kinds of under the table, informal, yeah. like at the oh, margins totally. form of work? Yeah. Forever. Forever. Yeah. Right. Um, and essentially, you know, the, the 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 place where I'm really excited to go with this book is in tracking back the kind of, you know, uh, in a kind of Polanyian project, right, of, of looking at, like, what were the ideas that substantiated um, these different kinds of platform, quote unquote, innovations in the first place, right? So, like, going back to platforms like eBay, who were, you know, mm. essentially trying to um, institutionalize reputation, on the internet, uh-huh. um, and to say yeah. like, how how have we missed <laughs> the the ways that things like trust and reputation are the fuel for yeah. these informal online economic spaces? Totally, and it's yeah. because we have been ignoring women's work experiences, where um, you know the ways that trust and reputation operate in labor markets for care work is extremely obvious, right? It is essential. Yeah, it's yeah, central. Yeah. It is impossible to miss. Um, Mm -hmm. and in a way that, you know, it was an important part of the Uber story, like at the very beginning, right? Like it was kind of like, oh my God, you're getting into a stranger's car. Like this is, yeah, yeah. They could kill you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it just, right. It just like went away. (laughs) We all like got real comfortable with it because of reputation systems. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that paying attention to these feminized forms of work, um, really brings that story to the center um, in a way mm-hmm. that it really has been a bit ignored. Um, and so I'm excited to, to talk about 
how this idea of trust and reputation has been institutionalized, um, how that has shifted, and of course, like attend to the COVID-19 kind of context, yeah, yeah. right? Because care has become this like insanely obvious political flashpoint. Um, yep. And the cost of care, especially, right? So mm -hmm. I have all kinds of new um, sites to to uh, incorporate into into the discourse analysis part of part of the research. So yeah, I'm going to be writing oh. it up. Um, I've been talking about it for a little while, and I can't wait to share more about it soon. That's awesome, Julia. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. It was really it was really a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Lee. Thanks for thanks for all the the service you're doing for for authors. It's wonderful. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. You can reach us with questions, comments, and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or by following me on Twitter at STS underscore news or on YouTube at People's Things. Our podcast is distributed by the New Books Network, the leading platform for academic podcasts, so that you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Peoples and Things, like most things in this world, depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out her work at julianacastro.co. Joe Fort is the producer for the podcast, and Mandy Lamb is the production assistant. This podcast and other Peoples and Things programming are produced in affiliation with Virginia Tech Publishing and supported by the Center for Humanities and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. For the entire Peoples and Things team, I am Lee Vinsel. And most importantly, I want to thank you for listening. Thanks.